Hello everyone and welcome to today's Vistage webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some items to help you participate in today's webinar. If you are experiencing technical difficulties joining the webinar session, please dial support at 888-259-8414. When you joined today's webinar, you selected to join either by phone call or computer audio. If for any reason you would like to change your selection, you can do so by accessing your audio pane in your control panel. During the presentation, all participants will be in listen-only mode. You're invited to submit a question through the question pane in the control panel. A recording of this presentation will be sent to attendees via email in 24 hours. I'd now like to introduce the moderator for today's webinar, Joe Galvin. Welcome everyone. I'm Joe Galvin, Chief Research Officer here at Vistage Worldwide. I'm happy to host the latest webinar in our Leading and Challenging Times series. This series provides a definitive source of thought leadership on pressing topics facing small and mid-sized businesses. Combining expert speakers like we have today with peer perspectives is how we help Vistage members make critical decisions that drive growth. Today's focus, the game of business development with Serrano Kelly. Serrano is a peak performance coach and sales trainer. He designed the 90-day game, which takes CEOs and sales teams through a unique process to increase productivity and better align their personal and professional lives. In this webinar, you'll learn how to identify and eliminate unproductive habits, how to develop an effective system for setting goals and staying on track, how to generate a team approach to business development, and how to learn key business communication skills that will get your entire team, clients, and members of your network to engage early in business development on your behalf. It's a lot to cover. We need to get started, Serrano. We're eager to hear from you. Let's get started. Well, Joe, an absolute pleasure to be here and to share this with the community. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little insight into my background, which would explain why would I have this interest in peak performance and how did I come about creating this process? that's been made now into two television shows and actually is currently appearing as a documentary on some 200 PBS stations. What I'm referring to is what we fondly uh, call The Game. The name of the book is The Game, When Your Life in 90 Days. So it is helpful to know a little bit about my background. Uh, you all know my hometown, right? I grew up in a very famous hometown you all know Brownsville, Brooklyn, because it's famous for two things. One of them you know very well. Uh, it was the home of Iron Mike Tyson. And during the time that he and I grew up there, and you all know Iron Mike, uh, Brownsville had the single highest murder rate in the country, even higher than Chicago. And by the time I was 16 years old, some 50% of the kids that I grew up with actually never lived to see 17. Now, at 16 years old, I escaped. I enter Vassar College, age 20, I land on Wall Street. I'm a sort of rising star and by 23, I'm earning almost a half a million dollars a year as a stockbroker. Now I have to share with you that as we uh, share this sort of uh, perspective on my life, it looks like, you know, here's someone who's, you know, making it happen, uh, a, 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 an early achiever, but in truth, what was going on the, on the inside was I always felt like I was skating by on my potential, that I was never really quite giving it my own. And it was as if I was waiting for something to happen one day that would kind of shake me out of my lethargy, get me to focus and give me this access to my so-called potential. At the end of my first year at Lehman Brothers, I had such an event. I walked into the office one day, I picked up the phone, on the phone was my kid sister, she was rambling. I told my family, don't call me during the business day. I'm on Wall Street, I'm a busy mom, all right? Only call me if it's an emergency. And it's only an emergency if somebody dies. And if somebody dies, don't call me, I can't help them, they're dead, right? <laughs> Literally, I was that cutthroat about my business. I picked up the phone. And it was a very cold February in the Northeast. And what had happened is that a space heater had fallen over in the kitchen that we grew up in and the wallpaper caught on fire. Well, unfortunately, uh, four of the children uh, were unable to get out of the house. 
And when the firemen put out the fire, they found four of the children all huddled together in the attic in prayer all dead. It was the single toughest moment of my life. And I never forget standing over their grave, uh, realizing that tomorrow was not guaranteed to me, that I was not guaranteed to have this opportunity to express my full potential. So I found myself getting intensely interested in this subject. And ultimately, I began to see something that I believe is easily observed by all of us. I could see that there are two times in life that a person is able to access their potential predictably. You know, in the world of sales, I would go in some days, right? And I would go in and feel like I cannot be denied. No one can say no to me, right? Like I would get on a roll, I would be in the zone, right? I'd be like, you know, at the top of my game. By contrast, there were days that I probably couldn't sell a machine gun in a prison ride. And those days occurred like the weather. Like I didn't know whether or not it was gonna be a good day because I didn't have a consistent access to my own potential. Well, sure enough, I can see that there are two ways in life that a person is guaranteed to access their potential. I do mean guaranteed. One is in an emergency, right? So, uh, you know, someone's like, well, you know, I, I, I'm not really good at running. My hamstrings are tight. My running days are over. If you, if you were being chased by a lion, trust me, if you figure it out, you would start running. The only other time I see you running that fast is in the Olympic Games. So there are two times in life that a person is literally guaranteed to access a deeper level of potential. One is in an emergency and the other is in a game. I will tell you that during the current times, a lot of what we're experiencing is emergency. But emergency carries with it sometimes a lot of heaviness. That sometimes it does have us activate this potential. Other times we can feel kind of suppressed and buried by the very negativity of the emergency itself. By contrast, games are, of course, meant to be fun. And you might think, well, coach, this is not a very fun environment, so I'm not really seeing this as a game. But I'd ask you to consider that if we were to approach this much more creatively, much more dynamically, if we were to allow ourselves to relate to it as a game, that we might find ourselves in a better position to confront the business challenges that we're facing. You know as well as I do that there are times you get very tight and very serious. It's all so serious. And those are not the times in many cases where we have our best ideas or a breakthrough in our thinking or some sort of paradigm shift where we see another opportunity, another market, another way to approach things, another stream of revenue. So I would invite you to take this brief journey with me and what if we looked at your life for 90 days as if it was a game? Now, what I was able to see is that all games have certain things in common, right? So think about it, doesn't matter if it's baseball, if it's basketball, right? It could be, it could be tennis, right? All games have in common that they all have rules. They all have a way to keep score. They all have winners and losers, right? So ultimately what we can see is there are these common elements of any game. And I ask myself, what if we actually superimpose that on a person's life? Fast forward, I end up spending two years becoming a media skills coach to the White House. I end up becoming the single largest successful uh, salesperson and trainer to Fortune 500 companies for the oldest and largest communication training firm in the country. I'm on television, Good Morning America, with my book, The Game, Win Your Life in 90 Days made it to two television shows and ultimately what you'll see is within just 90 days i've been able to transform not just individual lives not even just sales forces but sometimes entire school systems so ultimately you might say to me well coach you know games and emergencies are really different uh what do they have in common that is causing them to evoke this deep access, right? To invoke this deep access into a person's potential. And what I would ask you to consider is there are certain things that games and emergencies have in common. So for example, they're both win-lose scenarios. They're both black and white scenarios. I'm gonna literally walk you through the mechanics of creating your own quote unquote 90 day game for yourself, 
for your sales team, for business development. And ultimately, out of today's conversation, you will be able to immediately take next steps that can actually have a profound difference in your life starting immediately. So first off, let's confront this idea of a person's potential. So I'm going to ask you a question, and it's a very simple question, which is how much of your potential would you say you're currently tapping? Right? So you've all had times in life that you've been in the zone, times where you've had to dig deep, right? And and, and been shocked by what's possible. We all hear stories about like a woman lifting a car off her baby, right? Or, or, or someone dashing into a house, a burning house and carrying people out. We hear about these amazing stories and you've had moments in life that you've tapped into your potential. And my question is, how much of your potential would you say you're tapping into right now? Now, I don't know what number you came up with, and I would ask you to come up with a number. This is not a theoretical conversation. I'm not talking at you. I'm literally talking to you. I don't know what number you came up with, but I, I, I'd be willing to bet that that number is somewhere south of 100%. That many people, if you ask them, whatever number you just came up with, if that number was on your tombstone, would you really be happy with that? Is this really the best that you can do? You know, it's interesting in life that as life goes on and you get older, things don't become easier. So it's kind of like going to the gym. You go to the gym, the weights, they don't get lighter, your muscles get stronger. And what I'm saying is that though there are certainly problems and challenges, and I certainly don't want to ignore them, those challenges feel one way when you're bringing one level of your potential to the equation. And they feel really different when you're bringing a higher level of your potential to the very same problem. It's not that the problem got easier, it's just that you got better. And if there was ever, if, if there was ever a time to accelerate beyond your current level of capacity, I would say this is your moment. This is actually it. You know, let me ask you, how much of the day would you say you're really present? And I mean really present. So, you know, I'm not going to point any fingers, but certainly I've been guilty, right? At the end of the day, my wife says, how was your day? I'm like, hmm, hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. She's talking, I'm like, mm hmm, mm hmm, mm hmm. I'm not listening. I'm acting like I'm listening, right? Think about the average day. How much time would you say you're really present? Other people are talking. We're thinking about what's next, you know, or what we're going to say. You know, sometimes we're busy thinking about the past, wishing things were the way they the way they they were. We're thinking about the future. Can't wait till things change. How much time are you in the now? Let me give you another way to look at this. So let's talk for a moment about the past, the present, and the future. Particularly as we think about games and being in the zone and peak performance, let's talk about the past, the present, and the future. So anytime I'm thinking about the past, where am I now? Perhaps you guessed it. I'm in the present thinking about the past, right? So uh, what about when I think about the future? When I think about the future, where am I now? I'm in the present thinking about the future. The reality is, is that the present is the only time that exists. And my question is, how much time are you really in the present moment? Because that determines the degree to which you're able to bring the full force of who you are to any challenge or situation. I'd like you to come up with a number, right? A percentage. How much time would you say you're really in the present moment? I think many of us will admit less than 100% of the time. And again, you've had these experiences of being in the zone. You know you're capable of more. You know your company's capable of more. You know that your sales team is capable of more. But somehow, we don't seem to be able to unleash that full potential. If you actually were to ask most people how much time each day you would say you're really working, you know, people would be, you know, well, I'm very busy. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm on Zoom meetings and web, webinars like all day, right? Like they're very, really busy. 
but then ask them, how much time are you spending doing what you are uniquely qualified to do? And the answer, once again, is somewhere south of quote unquote eight hours a day. I think that most people are, are, are very in touch with themselves and they're definitely honest with me that, that they're not tapping into their full potential, that they're not spending the vast majority of their time in the present moment in the zone. And that in most cases, they're definitely busy, but they're not necessarily doing what they're uniquely qualified to do. Ultimately, in the 90 day game, a person is able to unleash that potential, but it requires that we be willing to take a look at one's entire life. Now you might think, well, well, wait a minute. I, I, I thought I was here to improve my business performance, my sales team's performance, and, and you're right. But let me ask you a question, particularly when people are paid to perform, leaders, salespeople, right? They're paid to perform just like athletes, right? Let me ask you a question. Do you think that the time that a person goes to bed at night affects their performance at work the next day? What do you think? Probably. What about the time they wake up? What about the quality of their marriage? What, what, what about whether or not they're getting exercise? Ultimately, when a person is paid to perform, what affects their performance in life is everything in life. You know, my wife's husband, my, my wife's uh, brother rather, played for the Patriots uh, as well as for the Cowboys. And my wife always makes this comment that, you know, when you're in the NFL and you're quarterback, you know, your biggest asset is your arm. Well, when a person is a leader or in sales, their biggest asset, their arm in this case, is their emotional state and their level of vitality and well-being. So as I introduce you to the game, do not be surprised that it is about how to achieve peak personal and professional performance simultaneously. Let me walk you through an exercise from the book itself, The Game, and you will be able to get the link to actually download your own copy of The Game. What you'll see is something that we call the game playing field. I'm going to ask you to do a simple exercise. What we do is we have you rate 12 areas of life. We turn all of life into this playing field. And then we literally take 12 areas and we ask you to rate them on a scale of one to 10. So what we want you to be able to see is how you're doing. This is like your scorecard, right? The one area that we will all have in common is work, but there are other areas that we have in common that are also important to our performance. I'm going to have you write down just, let's say, just the top three that people tend to play in their 90-day game. That ultimately what a person is going to look to do is to find the three to five areas of life that if they were to improve them massively and rapidly over just 90 days, that they would see an increase in their energy, their vitality, and their self-esteem. So body and health. Let me have you write down body and health. Now it's a scale of one to 10. So you woke up this morning, you went to the bathroom, you threw some water in your face, you looked at your body in the bathroom mirror and you thought to yourself, now that's a 10. That would clearly be very high. Where would you rate how you feel about your body and your health? I always tell people, looking good and being dead does not make you a 10. It says body and health. Are you not following certain medical protocols that you should be following? Are you on top of your necessary regimen to be at your physical best? Next would be money on a scale of one to 10. And I always tell people, let's say that you've got a billion dollars, but if you owe 2 billion, technically you're still broke, right? It's not about how much money you make. It's about how you're relating to it, how effective you are with it. Next is relationship. And there I am referring to romantic relationship. And in my household, if mama's not happy, nobody's happy. So how are those date nights going right now during this period of time on a scale of one to 10? And then let's add the area that we all very much share in common. So there are 12, right? Spiritual life, your state of mind, technology, your social life, community, environment, education, family, charities, hobbies, interests, and art. But now what about work? On a scale of one to 10, where would you currently rate work? Are you telling me right now that this is the best you can do? That 
that that that that there's nothing more possible for you that that this is all you're capable of where would you rate yourself on a scale of one to ten what happens is the individual player is looking to identify the three to five areas of life and just because something's low doesn't mean that that is necessarily what should be in one's 90-day game right so take for example family I would rate myself a seven, and seven is a pretty high score in the way that I would rate myself. The problem is my dad was a 10. He did a lot more with a lot less, so I have a higher standard for myself. So what you do is you look at the game playing field, all 12 areas, and you find the three to five areas, be they low or be they high, where if you had a massive increase in just 90 days, you would see an incredible boost in energy, vitality, and self-esteem. Now, in order for one to have a game, all games have a sort of finish line, right? A way that you know the game is over. So a lot of times in the world of sales, in the world of business development, people have somewhat ambiguous goals, like I wanna do better, I should do more, but the problem is that's not really workable as a game. So in a game, right, I have to come up with a specific measurable goal, like, you know, over the next 90 days, I'm gonna lose 20 pounds. Actually, over the 90 days of the pandemic, first 90 days, I actually lost 40 pounds, believe it or not, right? Over the next 90 days, right, I'm gonna take my sales from here to here. Remember, games are lose-win black and white scenarios, right? When people say to me like, you know, I wanna be in shape someday, there are three things wrong with that. First, when you say I want, that is not the language of commitment. You say shape, even a pair is a shape. When you say someday, there's no reason to start now. So do you and the members of your sales team, both personally and professionally have specific measurable goals? And what are the three to five goals that in 90 days, if you were to achieve, you would feel like you were on top of your game? The moment a person actually begins to have, forgive me for a moment, when a person begins to have the actual specific measurable goals, the mind immediately goes, well, how are we gonna do that? How, how's that gonna happen? And that's exactly the position that you wanna be in. And this is where we take a person's specific measurable goals, and then we create an even more defined quote unquote scorecard that we refer to as daily and weekly points. So in the 90 day game, a person is typically asked in the beginning to stick to just 10 points. And the individual is taking a look at, if I'm going to achieve this goal, what are one, two or three actions that I would have to do every day consistently to achieve those goals, right? If I wanna achieve a better marriage, if I wanna take my marriage from let's say a six to a nine, over the course of 90 days. How am I going to measure that? What are my daily and weekly actions? My, my daily point might look like, as it is in my game, I'm gonna do something every single day to delight and inspire my wife. My weekly point might be more like, I'm gonna create a sort of at-home date night, a romantic evening. This can be applied to any area of life. The bottom line is that a person when they wake up in the morning, is trying to hit or get their 10 daily points and their five weekly points, that if they were to do that over the course of 90 days, would have them arrive at their goal achieved. All of a sudden, we now have a game. But I'll tell you where this is very different than many maybe similar systems, and those systems are great. What I wanna highlight though is a critical difference, which is that in the game, there is a massive focus on accountability. So I'm gonna ask you to draw a diagram. It's a very simple diagram. If you can't draw it, then uh, just envision it. But people will reflect on this diagram sometimes long after this conversation and get insights into what's working and why, and what's not working and why not. So I'm gonna ask you to draw a diagram that explains, as it were, the secret sauce behind the game. And the diagram is an X. 
I'd like you to draw a small arrow coming out of the top of the X, a small arrow coming out of the right, a small arrow coming out of the bottom, and a small arrow coming out of the left. It looks a bit like a compass with a north, south, east, and west. So what we're looking at here is actually five forms of accountability. So once a person has a written game plan, they naturally intend to keep themselves accountable. Everyone does, right? So, you know, how many of you, right, would love to be in better shape? If I ask for a show of hands, I think most of you would raise your hand. You'd want to be in better shape. A lot of people want to be in better shape. If I asked you how many people also enjoy pepperoni pizza like me, most people would also raise their hand. And what you want to notice is that those two parts of the individual are not on the same page. There are days where the individual rolls out of bed and they can't wait to get to work and they're excited, right? And they're going to make it happen. And then days where the alarm clock goes off and a part of them is hitting the snooze button. What I'm saying is, of course, a person wants to hold themselves accountable. But there's a lot of variability in that. How do we actually take that first form of accountability and make it stable and make it solid? Well, in the 90 day game, uh, if you put above the X, the arrow pointing up the work coach, right? And in your organization, there's someone I'm sure who plays some role like that, then that kind of accountability we refer to as accountability to someone above, it is coach, it is a kind of responsibility, right? And then the accountability to the right is what we call daily accountability partner. And you'll see when you read the book that everyone who plays the game has a peer with whom they have a 10 minute daily accountability call so that every single day they can account for whether or not they're on track. The arrow to the left points to team, right? And we have this whole idea that with most people, when they feel a part of a team or they feel a part of a community like this business community, the bottom line is they don't want to be the one person to let the team down. And then most importantly, are the people who are, if you take the arrow that's pointing down, we call those people fans. And so what happens is when a person launches their 90 day game, we have them on day one, share their goals, with the people in life that they would least want to let down. We even have people uh, come to a kickoff call where people get literally like two or three minutes to share what they're committing to accomplish over the course of 90 days. And, you know, most people, as you can imagine, you know, they'll be on the phone, typically maybe on a go to webinar or something like that. Right. And you'll hear them say something like over the next 90 days, I'm going to lose 20 pounds. Uh, I'm going to get up early, early every morning and, and begin my day with prospecting and, 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 you know, they'll make all these, you know, rather large uh, claims. And then when they put down the phone, they think the same thing all of us do. What in the heck did I just get myself into? We call that boxing yourself in. So what happens is when I lead the game on that very first kickoff call, I literally tell everyone there that I'm pre-inviting them to come back at the end of the 90 days to see if we succeed. I'm fortunate. What I have is my statistical results are that 95% of the people who start the process that I lead, they finish the process. And 99% of those who finish succeed. Uh, we're seeing increases on the order of 300%. And while those numbers can sound really extravagant, how many people are really held accountable every single day? How many people have that kind of plan and that kind of rigor? What I'm saying is, is that under those conditions, people are able to unleash massive amounts of potential. And I love when we do the fans call. As a matter of fact, in full disclosure, I have my own personal lead later here today. I am a little bit scared because the fans call is what makes it real, right? That's where I'm putting it all on the line. You know, it's interesting that when people make New Year's resolutions, they often don't want anyone to know, right? Why, why, why would you not want anyone to know? People don't want anyone to know in case they fail, which is often why they do. The bottom line is that I've never seen you fail when failure is not an option. 
we find ourselves here during challenging times. Some businesses are doing well, some not so well. But in either case, people are in need of assistance. You provide a valuable service or product. If there was ever a time to get that to people, this is actually it. The game is simply a way of giving us a consistent access to deep levels of our already existing potential. I do want to share with you that there are a couple of predictable things that end up in people's games. So we refer to some of these items as dominoes. And I'll give you an example. So there was a time where I was struggling a bit with my weight and, you know, I was at the time single and, you know, nine o'clock at night, I would probably, you know, go out or order pepperoni pizza or have a glass of wine or, or watch some, you know, low grade late night television, right? And, and I found myself struggling with discipline. And I came up with this amazing discovery. So as opposed to at nine o'clock, beginning my evening carbohydrate surge, right? And low grade television, late night television, late, light, late, late night news surge, and going to bed at midnight, I literally ran an experiment for 90 days. I literally started getting up at 3 a.m. in the morning, no joke. I know that sounds extreme, but I want to run a test. And it's interesting, you know, at three o'clock in the morning, you can't get a Domino's pizza. At three o'clock in the morning, not really interested in a glass of wine and not much on television. What, what happens when a person gets up early is they tend to engage in those behaviors that are probably going to give them the greatest success in their day anyway. So let me share with you what are some of the points, right? Because when a person gets up early, they're likely to work out early. They're likely to start business early. Sometimes when people are telling me, you know, coach, you know, I can't wake up on time. I'm like, okay, well, what time did you go to bed? And, you know, that's kind of late. And I go, well, what had you go to bed late? And if we just keep tracing it back, what we'll see is that the real problem occurred much earlier. It wasn't basically about waking up. It was about what was going on the night before. So in the current environment, the individuals that I coach, often in their games, of course, one point, kind of the Tom Brady point, is go to bed early. For some people, that is, you know, as early as the Tom Brady time, which is 8.30 at night. And if you were training for the Olympics or you were trying to win, you know, the Super Bowl, that would not be considered too extreme to win that game. So many people don't realize that late at night they're not in their most productive mode and that what they need during challenging times is more sleep eight hours of sleep that would be another point getting up early that would be a point now here's where we come to an interesting part of the morning because we do suggest that many people if they can start their day with some form of movement there's a little game that we play called do 100 push-ups within the first 10 minutes of your day it's a way of what we call starting the motor. There's a doctor who actually came up with this, this whole idea of starting the motor. But specifically for sales teams, here's what we acknowledge. The reality is if you take a look at a year and you think of proactive time and reactive time, the most proactive part of a year is typically the beginning of a year. That's when people make New Year's resolutions, new commitments, right? If you take a look at a quarter, when do companies launch new campaigns, new contests, new products, right? The beginning of the quarter, because the beginning of a quarter is typically more proactive. What part of a week is more proactive? Well, you know, I think we'd all agree, the beginning of the week. What part of a day is most proactive? What we find is the beginning of the day. And so here's a key point in the game of a lot of the top salespeople that I coach. What they notice is, is that 20% of what they do generates 80% of their results. And what they do is they get the 20% that's generating 80% of their results done within the first 20% of their day. What I'm saying is that for most people, the first hour to two hours of their day, if they engage in those actions that are the most causative, the actions that are the most related to growth, like prospecting, like talking to top clients, if they were literally to start their day early and start there, that it wouldn't really matter that you can't control your whole day, right? 
as the day fo- go, goes on, things go wrong for you, things go wrong for other people, unpredictable things happen, right? That, 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 that's to be expected. But I'm only asking you in this case to control 20% of your day and the first 20% of your day. So what that typically means is, of course, starting the day early, beginning your day with business development, and then allowing other things that need to be done that are necessary to take place as the day unfolds, as the day unwinds. While these are very simple points in a game, it is very interesting when a person has a scorecard, when they have a daily partner, when they're committed to having a 10-minute daily call, and that partner asks them every single day, Monday through Friday typically, how many points did you get yesterday? And often the answer is something shy of 10. The person's like, well, you know, I got eight out of 10. The daily partner says, hey, that's great, right? Congratulations on the eight. What are the two that you missed? And then the individual shares what they missed, which the daily partner knows. And then they actually have to explain what are they now going to do differently to make this happen? What I'm saying is that in the game, a person is forced every single day to readjust, get back on track, and to actually think through every single day, how can they get a little bit better than they were the day before, right? What do they need to change and alter about the way that they're operating? You'll see if you look online, there was an ABC TV show called The Game Winning at Life that aired on ABC, where this was applied to an entire school system. The game has been used by the NFL, It's been played by Army Rangers, Special Forces, Green Berets, individuals, athletes who have incredible discipline in a specific area of life, but don't know necessarily how to translate that into other areas. Like being a great golfer doesn't mean that you're going to be a great husband or a great father. And what we find is that when people feel like they're on top of their games, they are able to access more of their potential and inevitably their impact with others is significantly higher. I often say to leaders, would you wanna follow someone who clearly couldn't follow themselves? And most leaders will say to me, no, absolutely not, absolutely not. I'm like, well, to what degree are you following yourself? They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I believe that there are things in life that you know exactly what you should do. And my question is on a scale of one to 10, are you getting those things done at a level of a 10? They're like, well, I'm like, well, it doesn't sound like a 10. And what I'm telling you is, is that the more that you can be in alignment with yourself, the more you're going to find that other people align around you and with you. And this fundamental principle of alignment is the actual essence of why the game works. We could divide a person into three functions, right? Mind, emotion, body. Mind, emotion, body. So typically the way the sequence runs is you have a thought, there's something that you want, something you want to do. You receive some sort of emotional desire or impulse to get it done, and then the body takes action. What then shows up is a result. The result is a lagging indicator. The leading indicator is obviously what goes on in mind and what goes on in the emotions, but that's not really seen. It's not quite as evident. So our attention tends to be on lagging indicators, which is either the results or our behaviors, wishing the results were better, wishing our behaviors were different, but not addressing what's at the source, which is the state of mind as well as the emotion. What happens is that if we take a look at it, People sometimes think that they should do something, but they don't feel like doing it. In which case, they're out of alignment. It's not going to happen. Sometimes people get really excited about things, but it's a short spurt because they can't get the body to keep the behavior up. It's not a habit. What we find is that games and emergencies have this tendency to create this intense level of inner alignment that when an individual aligns within themselves, this unleashes a tremendous level of power. When a team, company, or business aligns with each other, when they all have the same game plan, when they all have the same score in mind, 
when we're able to align a group of individuals, there we will find power. There is this relationship, both at the level of individual, at the level of team, at the level of company. The level of alignment determines the level of power. So in the 90-day game, a person puts together a game plan. This game plan is specifically to create mental alignment, and that's why there's this point system, right? These things give the person very clear understanding of what they need to do cognitively. There's aspects of the game that also allow one to evoke uh, an emotional alignment. Like we ask people to take on, you know, over this 90 days, what is the theme of your game? They're like, what's the theme? I'm like, well, you know, even a war, they give a theme to a name to D-Day, you know, Operation Desert Storm, Operation Desert Shield, right? My own current 90 day game is called Operation Expansion, right? That is the theme of the game. And there are other things that I've put into my game that are evocative emotionally of this idea of expansion. Then we add, of course, accountability, which is how we control and align the actions of the body with what we're wanting to do. When a person puts all that in place, ultimately what they begin to do is to produce results. And those results are a lag indicator or byproduct of everything that came before. One of the ways that we measure though the success of a person's game is by keeping statistics. So in all organizations, statistics are kept, but often those statistics are about lagging indicators. Whereas in the 90 day game, a person is tracking the actual activities, the actual time that they're spending. They're actually tracking the leading indicators, which are the things that they can control. As the individual feels that there's something they can control, they begin to be able to put forth more energy, more effort, they have greater certainty. No surprise, this leads to higher levels of activity and higher levels of activity always lead to higher levels of results. You know, I will comment personally, that uh, before COVID hit, literally, I was out speaking 150 to 200 times a year. I would leave home on Monday evenings. I would speak all day Tuesday, all day Wednesday, sometimes all day Thursday, fly back on Friday night, and all of a sudden, in an instant, in an instant, my business was technically over. That being said, over that period of time, while I'm not up 100%, uh, I'm, I'm moving very much in that direction. And if you took a look at my industry or my field, that's probably not the experience for many people who do what I do. But if you say to me, well, you know, what would account for that? Was there some magic? I will tell you the answer is no. Right? The leading indicator has a lot to do with my own level of activity. And when I massively increase my level of activity, no surprise, I get a lift in, as it were, the end result, which may look like revenues. In your own business, what would it look like if you took on a 90-day challenge? This year is almost over, but the game always requires that a person spend some time actually in preparation. So this could be a great time to actually download the book, to take a look for yourself at how this could apply to you personally and professionally as a leader, as someone setting the pace, maybe for your company or for your clients. Examine, what if you did take on a 90-day challenge? What would you play for, right? What would be your daily scorecard? How would you organize your time? What statistics would you most want to measure? And at the end of 90 days, who would you want to have held you accountable as you went through that experience? I believe that if you allow yourself to have every element in place, that I can boldly make the same statement now that you would see me making currently on PBS. This process works. 100% of the time, 
for 100% of the people who follow 100% of the process. The process always works, but one has to be willing to actually follow the process. Let me check in. I didn't mean to go as long as I did. I'd love to check in with Joe and see uh, any questions or anything that anyone has that uh, might actually illuminate how does the game get played. So Joe, uh, any questions that have come up as I've had a chance to share with folks about the game? Yeah, hi, Serrano. Thank you so much. That was really enlightening. And I want to encourage everyone, if you check your chat box, you will see a link to where you can download uh, the book, The Game. Um, and that will walk you through and take you through all the steps and bring enlightenment to all this. Um, and in fact, I wanted to ask you a question because early on in your forward, you actually mentioned that the game, your 90 day, the 90 day game, doesn't conflict with other types of programs in the genre. You know, there's a lot of other self help, do this, be all, you know, but this doesn't conflict. Can you elaborate on that just a little bit? So, literally, I, I always think of the game as like a syringe. You can put this is not a great metaphor, right? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. You, you, I know you. You can come with something better than this. Here's what I say, Joe. Right, that the game is like a syringe. You can put any medicine in it that you want. So those other programs, like firms, put in initiatives like, you know, whether it's recruiting more talent, diversity and inclusion. It doesn't matter. Like in the school system, they put in higher grades, less absenteeism. Right. So it doesn't matter what you put into the syringe as long as you put in you know, that medicine, the game is a delivery system for actually making it happen. So that that's why it really doesn't conflict with any other system. It's a way to apply any system. Okay, because the number of our members are, are do and engage in these different types of approaches. I wanna make sure that this is complimentary. They appreciate the fact that this in, intersects with all of those. Another thing that you mentioned early on where there were five rules to the game. And the one that struck me and I wrote down because I wanted to ask, ask this is that um, you have to give up self-criticism. Can you talk about that a little bit and why that's so important to being successful? You know, it's interesting. Uh, most successful people are hard on themselves. Like if you ask them who's their biggest critic, it's themselves. But what they don't see is that that self-criticism, while it does produce results, it also lowers a person's self-esteem. That actually a far better way to give results than self-criticism is to be held accountable. But we all know that accountability requires maturity because, you know, candidly, you know, people sometimes resist being held accountable because I don't want to be told what to do, right? But you take a look at, you know, the highest office in the nation, President of the United States of America, you know, it's, it's, it's literally, you know, the, the higher up you go, the more accountable you are. You know, I sometimes say that, you know, a homeless person, they can go to bed when they want, wake up when they want, eat whatever they want. I don't mean to be unkind about it, but they have no accountability. The more successful you are, the more accountability you have. It doesn't go any other way. So when a person drops up criticism and they dive in, accept accountability, what they find is immediately they're able to make progress and feel good about. I also remind people that when you tell yourself things like, I hope I don't make a mistake, it's very hard to uh, not envision in your mind making a mistake. And it can kind of set the stage for those things to happen. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, again, this is my question. <laughs> Uh, you, you asked us to rate our potential or rate for work or down the 12 different criteria. And you gave the example of you and your father. But can you give a broader set of guidance for how you create that scale? Because clearly, if you're in sales, if you're in business development, the numbers are the numbers are the numbers. But if you're running a business uh, apart from your revenue and customers, uh, you're trying to improve some of these more uh, uh, personal things. How do you create that scale without being too self too self-critical or living in some fantasy world? You know, the real trick behind the scale is that the scale is entirely subjective. But at the same time, there's a pseudo objective aspect of it, which is that you're always rating things in comparison to everything else. So for example, you know, there are things in life that, you know, I love to cook, I'm very good at cooking. But then I'll take a look at areas of life like technology and it's like, uh, yeah, I could use a little work there, right? It's the comparison of these things 
And often what happens in life is that a person will lean into their strengths. They will negate their weaknesses. And so the individual ends up kind of out of balance. Hopefully this doesn't lead to something uh, serious, but it could, you know, it could, you know one, one could work so hard that one ruins one's health. One could be pushing so hard and, you know, all of a sudden have a negative impact on one's family or vice versa for that matter. One could be so embroiled in family that one is not giving sufficient attention to one's work. The game is a chance to actually rebalance the equation. And what happens when you choose to write three to five, Joe, is like when the tides rise, all the ships rise with it. If you pick the right three to five, you will literally have a rise across every area of life because you feel like a better you. Well, you know, that was that was my follow-up question is how do you know when you're getting better, especially in some of these more subjective things? Like, you know, amazing you lost that amount of weight by being focused and doing the right things. That's measurable. You step on the scale. But in the relationship with your wife or in some of these other more subjective areas, how do you know you're getting better? And how do you know when you've kind of maxed out where you can be? Usually my wife, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know here's the feeling. Now, right? Literally anything can be measured. So take, for example, in relationship, I can, at the beginning of the game, ask my wife where she would score how I'm doing romantically as a husband. And I may not like that answer, Joe. But then I can also say, hey, what would be most meaningful to you that would raise that score for you? I've had that conversation with my, with my daughter, for example. I'd like to be an even better dad. Right? What could I do? Where would you rate me as a dad? Where, what would raise that score? And often what they tell me is not what I was thinking, right? I'm thinking, I, got, I need to spend so much more time. And she's like, actually, I wish you would play smash ball with me a little more often. It's like, I, I can do that, right? So I do believe that it's worthwhile to take things that are seemingly subjective do what we can to make them more objective, give ourselves a measurable way to impact them, because that is what we can control, our own behavior. We cannot control others, but we can influence them through our behavior. Excellent, thank you. Let me, let me move to some of the questions we received from, uh, from our members. Um, one is, what can be done about a boss who prioritizes catering to individual emotions over focusing on the big picture and end goal? and therefore addresses individual issues, but not company issues that would allow us to hit our goals. Meaning, I'm kind of zeroed in on my goals, but the boss is up here on this. How can I pull him, maybe not into the game per se, but into some of these concepts, him or her? You know, it's interesting because what's happening in that scenario is this individual, in this case, one's boss, may be feeling at the effect of the marketplace, right? And so they're having their own emotional reaction and they're having a point of view based on that reaction. We then have an emotional reaction based on their emotional, emotional reactions, which means everyone's out of alignment, right? What I would say is that we may not be able to control that person's view, but to what degree are you controlling your own behavior and your own reaction? You see, this is the part of the conversation that we all find a little bit difficult because what we want is we want other people to change. We just don't want to change. And what I find is that when an individual is actually giving it their all, they tend to be a great example. And the rightness of their action shows up as statistical results that are undeniable. That literally, that's like, that's like leadership by example. And that's not just for people at the top. It's, right. it's for all of us. We're all leaders in different aspects of life. Great, thank you. Here's a really good one. What is a better teacher, success or failure? And how do you harness failure. the right lessons from each? Failure. And why yeah. is that? So what happens is, is that with success, usually we're so busy celebrating the success that we don't analyze the success for replication. I wish we did, in which case it would be the same. Right. Often with success, the emotionality of it has us not really examine the source and the cause of it for duplication and expansion. Whereas with failure, we're very much more prone to self-reflection and analysis. If you take a look at it, anytime you expand something, it's going to at some point hit places where it breaks down, where it seems to fail. 
But those points of breakdown are exactly the places where correction is needed. So it literally is the information that's required for the expansion to continue. All too often, people are seduced into a kind of state of, you know, uh, of a lack of self-awareness by success. Whereas we do find that often people have deeper levels of self-awareness when they deal with difficulty or failure, just like we are now as a people and as a planet. Well, let me connect this to now the 90-day plan, the 90-day game, because a lot of us are going to jump into this. We're going to take a run at it in that first week. We're going to be all over it. And then something's not going to go right, and it's going to break down, and failure's going to come into play. Do we have to start over? Do we pick it up? Help us play through this concept of maybe not ultimate failure, but kind of you know falling off the wagon or losing the mojo on it. You know, there's this principle that I refer to as continuous sustained action. It is the reason for the daily partner because, Joe, most of us statistically, let's say we say, I'm going to start getting up early on Monday. I'm going to start starting my sales day with the following on Monday. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to go to the gym starting on Monday, whatever the case might be. And all of a sudden, you know, Monday happens and something blows up. You couldn't foresee it. So you're like, OK, I'll, I'll start on Tuesday. Would you believe it, Joe? Yeah. Another emergency happened on Tuesday. Funny how By, that happened. Statistically, most people will say to themselves, the week's almost over. I might as well start on Monday. That's one of the reasons why we ask you to realize, like my wife won five gold medals in the Junior Olympics. Her brother played for the Cowboys and the Patriots. Joe, if you ask yourself, how often did they train? The answer is every day. If a person wants to change their behaviors, they need to be engaged in that behavior change every day. Having a daily partner forces us to readjust every day. And if we're playing an aggressive game, we should have failures. We should fall down. But what did you learn when you get back up as a business, as a salesperson, as a person? What did you learn? Because that's the real value. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, we have time for one more question. And it, it, it connects to how you, you close talking about activities. And when you increase the amount of activities, then obviously results will follow. You also mentioned how in your business, moving from the physical to the virtual world, how in that space, obviously the challenges present itself. And we're experiencing that ourselves as we've gone from in-person meetings and in-person executive sessions to trying to do this stuff virtually. Can you mm -hmm. speak to the future of networking, right? The, the traditional face-to-face -face versus the virtual world we're in. This is actually coming from one of our Vista chairs. As we try to focus on in our world, how do we make the most out of this? And what does this future world look like? You know, I've never seen a period of time. I mean, I'm 58 years old, so, you know, there's, I've seen a, a little bit, right? I've never seen a more collaborative period in my life. Like the number of business leaders that I'm now collaborating with, the number of companies that I've been able to create collaborations with is at an all time high. I've probably created more collaboration in six months than I have in the last three decades of my career. I think that this is a time where people of goodwill who are looking for win-win partnerships have the greatest opportunity to build a network. And I think that the virtual aspect of it removes a lot of the impediment of schedules and travel and time. I think that there's an upside to this. But a person's got to be willing to embrace it and to find the value in it. And I think that building a network is a lot faster virtually than it ever could be face-to-face -face statistically. It's an opportunity. Interesting. Well, great. Let me sneak in one more if I could. Yeah. Because, <laughs> because a lot of this, this, this came in from the live segment. We get through the 90 days. We play the game. We see all these improvements. Then what happens? What do we do next? Do we start so over? Do we recycle or, or are we there? We, 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 we've been all we can be. I'm about to launch game number 78. So this will be my <laughs> game. That's what's happening today. And so what happens with behavior is first, when you want to change a behavior, the first step is it, it's sporadic. And that's where people get disappointed in themselves and criticize themselves. It's unnecessary. The next level is it becomes consistent. The level beyond that is it becomes intense. If you do something consistently and intensely enough, it will become a habit. Certain things can then also become a part of your character. 
even though there's a pandemic, people still brush their teeth. They're not like, oh my God, there's a pandemic. I'm so busy, I can't brush my teeth. That's because dental hygiene is a part of their character. For a lot of people in business development, candidly, prospecting may not even be a habit. So it takes very little disruption to throw them, right? Ultimately, by playing the game repeatedly and looking at one's quarterly earnings, a person is able to take behaviors and have them become habits. Ultimately, the goal is to have them become part of your character. Well, thank you for that. And I guess before you can win game 78, you have to win game one. And that's yeah. why I want to remind folks that you can find a copy of Serrano's book in the chat section. And Serrano, I want to thank you so much for your time today and sharing your insights and, and sharing this with the Vistage community. So thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Also, want to, want to remind everyone else that uh, a recording of today's presentation will be sent to you uh, in about 24 hours. So if you want to pick up some more notes or, or re-listen to it like I often do, that's available. And I hope you'll join us on our next webinar on November 13th. Well, we'll discuss how to future-proof your talent acquisition strategies. Uh, you can register at vistage.com slash webinar. That's vistage.com slash webinar. Thank you, everyone, for your time this afternoon. Uh, please stay safe, um, and please think about how the 90-day game can help you become uh, everything that you want to be. So thank you very much.